Okay, let's look at uh, page four. And uh, this is related to the earlier answer, but with a slightly different focus. And that is where we want to examine whether or not, this is the first question, of whether is the thought of privacy a move in the right direction or is the development of the thought of privacy something which is desirable? This is of course related to the earlier answer in that when I criticize BOC for example to say that it's not appropriate that was in relation to how BOC was common law right? and common law we had argued would result in a very fragmented position of law creates uncertainty is difficult to exactly determine or ascertain when is it that there is or there is no privacy in different situations and that all this is not good for a long-term sustainable protection on privacy but what has not happened of course is that in terms of the development in the UK and so I suppose that can be maybe a starting point right that uh, as an intro to note that in terms of recent or in terms of the so-called latest development in the UK we find that we have this particular case of uh, Google and Vidal and also the case of Ray PGS where in these two cases, mainly Google actually, Google being the main case where in these two cases the court seemed to have taken the position to seeing that there is now a thought of privacy in the UK there is now a thought of privacy in the UK and this is of course exactly what we want to address whether or not is this a step in the right direction okay. now in the first case of google the facts which appear in both, in both cases appear in the books now uh, and the case of google for instance was a case that talked about how of course google had collected information of uh, individuals and uh, they were upset at how the information was being used and they sued google uh, the issue actually concerned not so much as standing law, but it concerned more on the issue of whether could there be a service outside jurisdiction. So that's the this main issue actually. Can we serve an action outside jurisdiction? Uh, insofar as the rules are concerned, you can only serve it outside jurisdiction if it is a thought, but not if it's an equitable principle. And this is more thing. If we had kept misuse of private information as an equitable principle within BOC then it retains its equitable origin or character and being equitable, you cannot serve outside jurisdiction it's within jurisdiction it's the one I said just now that when we talk about BOC uh, it's really an equitable principle it's confined to within jurisdiction, not outside okay. so this case of Google had that kind of a, a background issue where the issue was more of whether could we have served an action on the particular defendants outside the jurisdiction. It could only be so that if it's not an equitable principle but instead a tort. As what the court did, the court actually confirmed to say yes, it's a tort privacy. Or it's a tort. And being a tort now, that's why we would serve outside jurisdiction. Okay? Now, so this is really your first paragraph. And if it's appropriate, what you can do further is to maybe even uh, briefly summarize the key principles that the case talked about, which you have in your notes on page 4 itself. Look at the uh, second paragraph at the last line. Okay. So in Vidal's case, or the whole paragraph, uh, second paragraph, the whole paragraph, in Vidal, after conducting a survey of all the cases on this area, the Court of Appeal observed that leaving aside the circumstances of his birth what was birth? he was born out of the equitable realm of BOC and the key phrase is equity again okay? leaving that aside they said there was nothing in the nature of a claim to suggest 
the, the more natural classification of it as a thought is wrong. And then actions for BOC and actions of misuse of private information rest on different legal foundations and protect different legal interests. So they're saying that we should not continue protecting privacy using equity. We should protect privacy as a thought, right? And so they're not saying it. And then you read the whole paragraph, it talks about how they want to recognize this with a thought. Although, look at now the fourth paragraph, they say this, or fifth paragraph, they say this. It is interesting to note that the Court of Appeal went to much trouble to clarify that they are not creating a new thought and that it existed already. In other words, what they are doing is this. They are saying that actually this is something which had existed in the form of misuse of private history. And that they are not creating a new thought. It is rather an existing law, just that it came from equity. So whether you call it a new thought or whether you call it an existing thought doesn't matter. But the point is that now Google is placed a case that very clearly confirms that it is a thought. Right? And so now we discuss whether it's a step in the right direction, why or why not. Yeah. Now then in your next part of your answer is where I argue how it is inappropriate to have a separate thought. How it's inappropriate to allow the laws of privacy to continue to be protected under common law or under thought. Okay. Now the first argument is this: that there is no need for such a development. There is no need for such development because whether it is under equity or under thought, the law is not developed to the point where compensation can be available, okay? There's compensation. Today, and I stress now, today because this development can be available. In other words, my point is this, that there is no need to create a thought or for the law to be categorized or for the law to be classified as a thought, just for the purpose to allow for a claim of financial competition. Just for claiming that is. Now this particular paragraph or this particular point one is what I mean mentioned too briefly earlier on in the earlier answer. In that equity is not able to provide damages automatically. In that is only discretionary. Right? And it's why we always ask for a development of recognition of the thought of privacy so that if it is recognized as a thought, then therefore we can allow for damages. This is the argument, right? Let's create a thought of privacy because being a thought, then we can allow for a claim for damages. Equity, BOC don't give you damages. Now, however, my point is this, and we can refer to your notes for the further details, that that is actually not a very strong argument to call for reforms or to use thought to be protecting privacy. Because what has happened is that today, and we have various developments, various cases, which you can see in notes now, cases have brought out that actually compensation is available. So if compensation now is available, whether it be under common law or statute, then why is there a need for us to call for the creation or the classification of privacy to be taught just to get damages. You don't have to. Okay? I can understand that if case after case after case, that because of BOC being equitable, you don't get damages and it's sort of unfair on a claimant, then sure, then just reclassify to be taught and permit them just to give damages. Then that's correct. But the fact is it's not so. That today, because of the developments of common law, even though BOC is equitable, the judges have granted damages. And moreover, this is not just common law. We also have common law, we also have statute. For example, if you infringe a PDPA, 
If you infringe uh, the relevant statutes, there is or they do allow for claim damages. So it's not as if now that a claimant, because of VOC, they can't be equitable, they can't get damages. They still get damages using existing common law or using new statutes. And so therefore, there is no need, therefore, no need for such development, which is no need to develop a separate tort of privacy. The existing laws can grant you compensation anyway. Okay, that's point one. And then point two, right, on how or why is it that we don't need this protection, this is on page five, point two, is that there are already existing laws. Here they are, existing laws. This, of course, could be the top common law. For instance, now we have VOC. We also have other statutes, okay? And we have statutes. And so there's no real need for us to have to, again, invent or create or classify this misuse of private information at all, okay? Now, given the VOC, for example, even though, yes, it's uncertain, but if you want to examine the cases, the fact does remain that we have come a long way in the UK from a position where previously there was no privacy protection, but today we do have. So for example now, if you find the topic in the exam question, you know, contrast the case of K and Robinson. There was a case where the court said that there was no law on privacy. This old case. And it's not so old, 1980, no law on privacy. Then you contrast now with the case of Campbell. Okay. Or the case of Bonnery, for example. Or any other case that you want to choose. And my point is to show how there is available protection. Common law has proven itself to be effective, to be flexible, and accordingly, therefore, it's not as if that we need to still have a new law. Now, but you notice now when I put the word common law, I put a few other arrows. It's not just VOC actually. There are also other common law principles that we can use to protect privacy. For example, if someone were to get your phone number and keep on calling you. Now, in a way, if this person keeps on calling you, you will say it's in vision privacy. But if he keeps on calling you, there's also another law that comes up, which is what? Harassment of my friend. What if now he were to enter your house with a concept to intrude on your privacy? If he enters into your house without your consent, without your consent and intrude on privacy, there's another law as well. Trespass, am I correct? So, or let's say now if he follows you wherever you go, he's stalking you, right? Harassment again. So my point is that there are other laws that you can use. So let's put it here now. For instance, there could be harassment. Or they can be trespass. So there are different types of common law principles that we can use. On statutes, of course, say we have the PDPA. In one example, but increasingly you find that there are different regulations. The banks, for example, have their own requirements. Uh, many of these uh, government organizations have their own regulations right, to safeguard the information of clients or customers or citizens. The police, I'm sure, the police act somewhere, or the police will be somewhere. So there are laws that we have that can be used to save current privacy. And with all these laws, why then do we still want to say, ah, let's evolve, we will see, and we can want to privacy. There's no need to. Now, again, of course, if you recall or you follow what I've been saying in the earlier part of the class, this is also a bad point. What's a bad point? The laws are fragmented. It's a bad point, right? The laws are all over the place. Why must a citizen go to trespass, harassment, PDPA, or this regulation, or this statute, or VOC, to find out his protection? Is it a good way forward? And even yes, the law is involved in VOC, from no protection to heavy protection, but still it's uncertain. How do I know I have protection? Is it understandable? It's two part test. All the factors, handover's case. Do we understand the theme, or is there any coherence in protection? So every good point is a bad point. Every bad point is a good point. It really depends on the type of question you get, as well as your personal conviction. Right? So in that sense, I'm just going through the points. 
it may be that you want to take the same coin to flip it over to other otherwise it's fine or you do add on more things to support it's also fine so for now i am trying to argue to saying that there is no need right for such the development first point and now here a continuation because we already have existing laws. okay number three and it's linked to the second as well is that the subject of privacy is so wide that the ramifications of any freestanding law of privacy is better left to parliament and point three i think is actually a good point is that we are now saying that if we were to want to improve the law further one improvement is to legislate which is better compared to using common law develop, development or common law taught which we argue is not so good okay. privacy being a very fundamental right privacy being something which involves a very wide scope of things it's better that we have parliament to for example, when we talk about privacy, it could be very wide ranging. It could be from your image to your picture, to your name, to your voice, or your sound like. So for example, let's say now if I were to pretend to be you and I use your voice to conduct the activities, I call someone to defraud a person, I call someone now to pretend to be a family member now to kidnap a person for ransom or something. Now, the, the thing is that all these kinds of impersonation, all these kinds of uh, appropriating of your personality is an intrusion of privacy. So there's so many different uh, facets of how someone's privacy could be infringed. It could be a case of where I may not mention your name, I will not mention your face, but I describe your characteristics to someone else. And it fits you exactly, you know, you are the person I'm describing. So again, now you feel it, my privacy is not being intruded. So how do we regulate this? Do we use common law or is it not better for a statute to come up? Okay? So there's this point here. The idea of course is that we have to promote and to ensure that there is less certainty in the law which is desirable for privacy. Then number four, and the last one, okay? Is of course the earlier comment that we made uh, from the earlier answer is that further common law expansions so if we were to focus or continue using common expansions, it will erode privacy further. This of course is really the earlier answer. Okay. So you refer now to the earlier answer or combine together now to talk about how privacy is further eroded if we were to continue using common law transfer. Now, it's not as if that we are saying that the laws are totally bad. The laws may be working, but it might not be sustainable. The laws may be working, but the more it expands and develops, it actually ends up giving us more alternatives. Like what I said just now, the factors. You know, we have now handed over number one, number two, number three, but yet when you apply to the facts now, you have different conclusions. And what may appear to be private to one may not be to another. It's again very subjective. And the judge themselves actually, uh, in, different, in different cases, have given different views. Like Murray, right? Murray first instance was different from Murray kind of view, different views. And so because of that, what we are saying is that it's not a very reliable uh, development to continue relying on common law. Because your privacy, as opposed to being strengthened, will be actually Order. It's better that we have a fixed position taken. Bridget maybe, but at least now we can, in some sense, uh, quantify what the rights are based on statute, as opposed to leave the common law to develop on a case to case basis. The law becomes very bulky. You know, we have one principle here, another there, or this provision something else. And then overall, now the law is so messy, as my whole point now, that it's very difficult for an individual to know exactly what his rights are. It's good that we consolidate everything. Put it all together in one place and say, okay, these are now your rights. We contain it, we can manage it better. 
then to let it be free static, to let run loose. And when you run loose, then the law becomes very unwieldy, bulky, and complicated. Okay? So this is something you can use now to understand, right? How this point four works. The next part of the answer is we will not argue the opposite. So it's pros and cons, right? Whereas now we argue that there is a need, right? So now we argue uh, arguments in favor of a tall apparently. So how do we argue that there is or that we should develop a separate thought apparently? And the first point is this, where we are arguing that there is a distinction to be drawn, a distinction, or there's a difference between BOC and between privacy. That they are both different, both protect different aspects. The focus on VOC laws is it protects what is confidential. Okay, so the focus here is that it protects what is confidential. But it's different, right, from what is private. So we should not be using something that's meant for confidentiality, expand it, distort it to protect something else. It's like, for example, we have the tort of negligence. And we know now the first requirement is duty of care. Breach of duty of care, causation with bonus. Now let's say now we develop a law of negligence. We say, well, uh, we will use the tort of negligence to sue someone even though he was not negligent. Expand it. Now my point is, why expand the tort of negligence to the point where you can use to sue someone when it's not negligent. Because if it's not negligent, to call it still negligent is wrong. No? Same thing. If it's no longer confidential, or it's still private, it's the point confidential and privacy is different. If it's no longer confidential, then why are we using laws of confidentiality? A good case now to illustrate now is this case of Ray Vigens. In Ray Vigens, this was the very issue that arose. In fact, I now realize as I mentioned PGS, I think I mentioned the earlier case wrongly. Just now when I mentioned the case of the 40-year-old boy involved in racial riots, there was a real PGS, there was another case. What is it then? You didn't realize the mistake. Anyway, uh, if you go back to your notes, the first page, no, sorry, uh, the second page, you have a Ray JR38. Okay, that's the case. So again, now you go back to your post now, my, my mistake. When I mentioned just now the racial riots, the case of a 40 year old boy, I think I said Ray PJS, that's an error. That actually was a case referring to here, Ray GR38. Okay. All the points are the same. Only the thing, the thing is the name of the case is wrong. Huh? But now let's look at Ray PJS. Okay. Ray PJS, I'm not so sure when I mentioned this during lectures, but it's in your notes now. PJS was a case concerning uh, a case you're familiar with actually, or you may have heard of before. And that's concerning Elton John's novel. Elton John, of course, is infamous because he's the first gay partner to register his marriage, his civil marriage in UK, right? His gay partner. Uh, anyway, this case concerned how Elton John's lover had, I think, affairs with his other one or two other men. Of course, it's not something that's good, like, right? It's like an affair kind of thing. But somehow now, this was a story picked up by a newspaper, uh, by social media, in right? fact, it was spreading. And in fact, I think it also was published uh, in America as well, newspapers. Elton John's lover obtained an injunction in UK to stop the publication of that information. Of course, it's damaging himself. Then we need the other job box. And so the claimant had successfully obtained an injunction. But however, now there was a challenge to that injunction. They said, why should the injunction be granted? 
we can only draw that injunction if what you are trying to obtain is to prevent the material from being out there, from being in the public domain. But in reality, by now, this information has been published in America already. It's in social media. The press in UK cannot print it. But today, do you read this paper today? Or do you go on Facebook more more? Or on social media? Today, the fact is this. There are alternative media, my friend, online media. What's the point of giving injunction to suppress information? There's no normal confidential. And now that's my main thing now, to discuss this point, okay? Ray Pijas was a case where the facts were no longer confidential. How so? It was printed in, this, in America. It's available online. Should we still grant an injunction in UK? It okay, should we still grant an injunction in UK? Now, to test you whether you understand this whole discussion, let me ask this. If we were to protect someone's privacy based on confidentiality, clearly you would see that on the facts of PJS, there's no longer confidentiality. And therefore, my point is this, if no longer that, if lost, therefore, there should be no injunction. Okay, therefore, if it's lost, as it's no longer confidential, it's information in the public domain, people can access it, read it online, then why should we still be injunction? But whilst this full confidential, is it still private? Yes. Although no non confidential, but it's still private, right? But it's still private. And being private, therefore, we should still allow for an injunction. This now is the main divide that the judges were, have, were discussing in this case. Should we or should we not allow for injunction? And now you can see why we need to move or shift VOC from VOC to shift to a tall privacy. Argues in favor, in favor of what? Of a tall or privacy. We want to make the shift of VOC to because why? If we still keep using VOC laws to protect privacy, then we'll lead to this position where once it's lost, you can no longer run the junction. But yet, but yet, we still see how they should get it from injunction. And that's why we argue this is a good argument in favor of creating or recognizing of non privacy. So there's no longer premise of confidentiality. So that even if it's lost, right, it's still private, and therefore, you can still maintain injunction. Which, by the way, was the judgment in Ray Pijas. Now, of course, there was a dissenting judge, which I mentioned in the next page, uh, Lord Tolson. Uh, Lord Tolson, the dissenting judge in the next page, he argues that why are we doing this? Is this absurd to still allow for the injunction? And it's a mockery of law when anybody knows that this is who he is. He's saying, don't let people know what's happening. But everybody knows what's happening. He said, for example, uh, you recall about uh, two years back, uh, the one MDB scandal. Uh, and of course, Naji was under investigation, am I correct? But the newspapers never mention the name, right? They mention what? Um, MO1. Uh, MO1. We all know who the hell is MO1. But no, we won't mention his name because why not verify that? So something similar. We can't mention this story. But we all know what's happening. So that's why now Lord Tosan argue that no, no, no. Why do we want to still run the injunction? So he was against the grant of injunction. Now, of course, although he was against the third injunction, he was different from saying that you should be privacy. All he's saying is that we should look at the whole thing and say that so long as you have lost our true nationality, it's out there for the domain, there's nothing more to protect. But if you're not wrong, nothing more to protect. What are you protecting? What secret do you say is a secret? It's not a secret. No. But of course, this was my minority view. The view by the majority, which I agree with this, it may no longer be a secret. Some is out there, I know. But still, the fundamental aspect of privacy is not that secret, but it's something where the intrusion could cause harm. Now, even if the social media may care the story, but at the very least, it's not in mainstream newspapers, at the very least. For example, uh, if you were to 
try to locate the facts of Elton John's lover and affair in UK, it's not so easy. If you were to search for it, can you find it? Yes, you can. Or go online. Huh? But when you look around all over, you don't find it. And my point is that that small thing, even though it's not very effective, it still serves a purpose. And that's why the view of the majority, in my opinion, is preferable. And it's why now, in a sense, it's correct for us to draw a distinction between what is confidential and what is private. Okay? So this is the uh, point one now, which I will refer to one more time uh, from a different angle later in other points. And then the second point of why this recognition or development of thought is useful is this. The number two. That the recognition of this thought of privacy has useful and important implications. Has useful and important implications. And by that, this will be the very facts of Google itself. You look at the facts of Google. Where when I began the class, I told you that this was a case concerning now of service of a writ outside jurisdiction. Whether or not can we serve a writ outside jurisdiction? If this is an equitable law compared to where it's taught, if it is equitable, then you can't serve it outside jurisdiction because equity is only confined to within jurisdiction. So therefore now, you cannot serve it. But if you do reclassify the law, you see the law is not equity. The law is tortious. That's it. And therefore, you can serve it. So by that, you can already see how the development or recognition of privacy to be a thought is something that is not just a mere label. It's not potato potato. In the past, by the way, this is what I would have said actually. If I have taught the same class here, say four years ago, three years ago before this case, I would have said that whether you call it VOC, whether you call it MPI, misuse of private information, whether you call it thought of privacy, it doesn't change what it's just a law that protects privacy. That's what I would have said. But today, we get the Google's facts, we now can see a different angle. It's not just a mere label. The labeling itself is important because why? If you label it as equity, you can serve outside of jurisdiction. If you label as a thought, then you can. That's the point. They serve practical qualification. Therefore, the argument that we develop this sort of privacy is a good argument. It supports the argument in favor of it. Okay? So that's number two. The third reason, number three, is of course a, a similar point that as a result now, it will allow permit or allow for claim in tort damages. Okay. This will allow for claim in tort damages. And of course, tort damages in some sense, right, uh, is more generous compared to other measures of damages. For example, you know this, right? Tort of defamation. Now, I know, of course, that in many countries, UK, Singapore, we today have rules of the High Court or we have statutes that have kept the damages to defamation. To be fair, I'm not too aware of the development. In UK, we have that. Do you know? For defamation, is there a statute to cap the damages? You say, oh, even though defamation, you can't sue beyond so much. Do you know? Is it? Okay, anyway, uh, we do have some countries that do that. They cap it. The idea is that you, we can't let you claim, oh, uh, my reputation is worth 10 billion, so I'll sue you for 10 billion. And it's ridiculous, okay? So there tend to be a particular either regulatory cap or at least by way of common law. Um, in Singapore, for example, I know that we have, it's not statutory by the way, but in Singapore we do use 
a framework or a guideline, looking at preceding cases, and then look at now your case in comparison, you see how much you get. So if this particular person who is so famous gets so much, you are not so famous, you get less of you know, that kind of thing. Now of course, you may feel that no, although I'm not so famous, but my reputation to my friends are uh, important to me, and they might want to sue. Which in a way to be fair is true. Uh. So just because I'm not so famous, does not mean that it's any lesser damage to me. Am I correct? My reputation is what I feel is important and is worth so much. It may not be that I'm famous, but that doesn't mean to say my reputation is any lesser. Right? Uh, so this is an area where it's going to be contentious. We, we know that. We also do know that damages in tort of defamation can go very high. Why? My point here. Tort damages can be generous. So we want to call for something similar. A development of privacy to allow for generous damages. Otherwise, you find that the claimant may bring the case, forget nothing. A good case, by the way, is this. Uh, you call, for example, right? look at the case of uh, Mosley. In Mosley's case, this was where he got damages of 16,000. During lectures, I think I mentioned this as well. Mosley is the, is the guy. Uh, he was the former F1 uh, CEO, Max Mosley, and he was involved in a sex scandal where a video of him was circulating of him having sex with some prostitutes. He was wearing, wearing a, a Nazi Germany uniform, the S and M kind of uh, uh, equipment, you know. So his reputation was affected, and he sued. Now this case is actually very interesting for many issues, but anyway, when he sued, he was successful. And he got back sixty thousand pounds compensation. What is sixty thousand for him? I mean, he's a famous man. He's wealthy to begin with. This to him, like you know, one holiday somewhere or a weekend trip somewhere, like this you know. So he actually wanted more, but he could not. And that's why back then, BOC was an equitable principle, and equity would not give you damages to prime remedy. This one example. Another. This one I don't think I said, but if you look at your notes and all that, is again a Douglas Hello. Douglas case, they won the famous case that they won. This was the Michael Douglas wedding, they won. Did you know how much you won? 7,000 pounds. For a case that went all the way to the box, 7,000 pounds. Now I'm not so sure who paid the legal cost, huh? but I bet you his legal cost is more than that, for sure. 7,000 pounds. Although I think it's 7,000 pounds each, like 7 k for him, and then the wife is 7,000. So 14 they get back. This is real business. Okay. Uh, he actually got more, not he, sorry. Uh, the magazine got more. When this case went to the House of Lords, the magazine also sued on privacy. They said, well, as a result of the loss of the information, because of the misuse of personal private information, the magazine suffered a loss. Which is why the other magazines had published the pictures first, right? And they so they got more damages. To be fair, because why there's an economic uh, company, economic laws, so of course they're not mine. But the thing is this normally for privacy, it's a permanent thing, am I correct? How much can we give you? You lose privacy. How much is that? Compared to a magazine, not being able to publish the pictures, I can understand. Economic laws more quantifiable, you got more. And so the irony is this that in that Douglas case, the magazine got more damages than the others. Why? Because it's a personal, private matter, and how do you quantify the damages? But the moment we categorize that to be a tort, then maybe, you know, the tort might be more generous, which is so now, an example now being defamation. Okay? And make a this. This is point number three. And then point four, the last paragraph. This is similar to my point one actually, which is that being a separate tort and not subject to the law. Of confidentiality will allow the judges to sex step the problem with the grant of an injunction where there has been a loss of confidentiality. So this was the point I said earlier on, right? Where in BJS they confirm that the grant of injunction would be the only practical and effective remedy for the claimant in respect of any invasion of his privacy. Okay. So we want to be able to allow for a grant injunction, and the only way to grant injunction would be that we recognize that your right subsists, your right retains, 
even though you lost confidentiality. Here's my point point. Okay. That allows for an injunction to be granted. And this injunction is important because we're not arguing that an injunction is the only practical and effective remedy. Although I did go on and on about damages, but at the end of the day, even damages is only one part of the whole thing. What is more important is not even money, it's injunction. I want injunction. But how do I get it? Right? So by recognizing the tone of privacy, it allows for injunction to be granted even though even though the information is no longer quote unquote confidential. So even though it is out in the public domain, even though it's no longer confidential as such, does not matter? We are not protecting confidentiality, we are protecting privacy. So when we recognize that the law is privacy and not confidentiality, it allows for the injunction to be still granted because there's now an intrusion of privacy. For which we identify now an injunction to prevent that intrusion of privacy. Okay? So it's my point four, which is similar to my point one early on. Uh, we will be very good at the point. On point on page six now, point number five. That there is nothing wrong, or rather it's uh, not uncommon for common law to evolve and to develop new laws. It is not uncommon for common law to evolve and to develop what we call new laws. This point requires me to go back to an earlier comment where I said to you that common law is such that it evolves. In fact, if you study your uh, common law or your LSF, if I ask you, ask you, do judges create law or make law, what's the answer? The correct answer is correct. Judges don't make law, correct? The role of judges is not to make law. There must be that separation of powers with the executive Judiciary legislation. The judiciary now they don't make law. They interpret law, am I correct? They interpret common law based on the doctrines of judicial precedent and they interpret statutes based on the rules of statutory interpretation. They don't make law. They can't say today, uh, I think you should win the case. And then they make a law. They, they can't make law. You know that, right? It's common law. And so the reason why common law very often is piecemeal, my other comment, is because it evolves. They can't make new law. But my point is this. Although they should not, but we do know that they do, am I correct? It's not a common for common to evolve and to develop new laws. I'm not saying they're creating. I was very careful now to say it was like evolve or say develop and to create life. A good example now, actually, is this law of tort or harassment. If again you study this in tort, you find that the tort of harassment that was created was actually an evolution. Previous to this, there's a case called uh, Kora Sanjay and Bush. So this is the to you. This case Kora Sanjay and Bush, where it was the case that recognized this tort of harassment. But before that, it was nothing else. And so my point is that if we can evolve and recognize new torts, why can't we also evolve and recognize now a new tort of harassment? It does happen. Okay? And so long as it's justifiable, then we should commit for it, right? Number five. Then number six, just two more to go. Or one last one, right? Uh, this now goes back to the recent case by the Supreme Court in PGS. So it'd be good if you can make more effort in your answer to relate to newer cases, which is what I've done here. Google's case, PGS, even the uh, uh, Ray JR 38, the earlier case of the racial rights. All these are Supreme Court and very recent cases. Now, yes, your case of Campbell, Douglas, Frank Over, Murray, those are important, it's all here as well. But I am making more effort in this class to focus on the Supreme Court cases than focus on this whole development of tort privacy from Google case and another case of BJS. 
because this is the so-called current contemporary issue. What, is, what issue is this? The issue of whether or not should there be a port of currency. Because VOC, although good, might not be sustainable, might not be a long-term solution. It may erode currency further, make it more fractured, make it more piecemeal. Let's now consolidate it all, either under a statute, if not under a port of currency. PGS has done that. Okay? Is leaving it to be a part to be a tall and for good reason. So point six now, one last one, okay? It is what I said earlier on, which is my point one, is that they are drawing a distinction between private or secret compared to whether or not it is something which is confidential. So my point six actually is not a new point, it's the same as my point one, just that there's a bit more argument there in justifying how the privacy should be protected by way of injunction. Is something worth that? If I may, I'll just put it here like this now. That privacy is an aspect or is something worth protecting. And VOC laws are inadequate. Okay. So it's how the phrase is quite system. Which is something I've said earlier on, but now in a different manner, perhaps. That privacy is worth protecting. To prevent an intrusion, to prevent a distress, to prevent any humiliation. And therefore, that's why we should develop a thought of privacy. Okay. VOC is, in a sense, in and Okay. Any questions? Uh, actually, why not? Uh, you should. Only thing is, try not to go overboard because there's not a case. Whereas we are studying law, today, so we must back up law cases. But I think it'd be good to do so uh, because many at times uh, academics they like to see reference of laws to current affairs. Especially, for example, jurisprudence, when you go there, you have to make reference to current affairs. Uh, so if you can. So what you could talk about really is how uh, the very fact that we have governments trying to clamp down on Facebook itself is a recognition that privacy has to be controlled. We don't, we, we can't leave the common law. We can't leave the contract. Oh, Facebook depends what? The consumers, the users know that they can check their privacy. They can control who sees what. This is what they are saying at Facebook, right? But the fact is that, yes, there's that control, but the thing is that sometimes people may not fully appreciate how to use this control. And I can control my settings to let my friends see. But the thing is this, my friends' friends may see their stuff, right? right? And so when my friends' friends see their stuff, they see my stuff, you know? So that's the point, we need to have regulatory control to ensure that it's more streamlined. Uh, so you can use to argue to call or reform for not common law but for regulatory controls. Any questions? Okay. Maybe since you mentioned Facebook, let me bring up this point for you to think about and to even add to your answer. But currently, the main focus of VOC, this part of VOC, okay. When I say to you that uh, it's inadequate. VOC for now is this two-part test, Article 8 and Article 10. And Article 8 requires us to ask, is there any reasonable expectation of privacy? What you could do actually, which I've done more or less just now, but let's do it one more time here is, although in theory, we understand that there is protection for privacy, in theory, we have a law that protects privacy. This article 8 test to ask is there a reasonable expectation of privacy? But there is a problem. First of all, this one. What is reasonable? Similar to what I said just now, right? To a 14, or sorry, to a 17 year old toddler, is it reasonable for him to expect privacy? You ask me no way. But then again, to the mother, the mother says yes. To a 14 year old boy who is sex now to be in both racial riots, 
Is it reasonable for you to accept privacy? The mother will say no. Uh, the mother yes, the mother yes. The police will say no, right? So what is reasonable is actually not a very fair test to use to assess the privacy. We should have, if possible, some kind of coherent principle or fixed standard of privacy that we all expect. Not limited to what is reasonable. Okay, so this is something I've said before, which we now can illustrate here. Not only really that, the other thing is the other problem, privacy. What is privacy? What does it encapsulate? What is within privacy? Your name, your age, your, your description, your photo, your image. Right? I mean, what is within privacy? What do we expect? If I am walking on the street, I'm in public place, no. If I'm walking on the street, I'm in public place. I should then be taking the risk of people to see me and take a photo of the microphone and my phone. So that design is also very ugly. And of course, now put the whole together, okay? Expectation of privacy. Reasonable expectation of privacy. Today, in a modern context, modern society, do you think we would have more or less expectation of privacy? In a modern society, what is our expectation? More or less. Less. Why less? Today we know that there are cameras all over. Today we know that individuals have smartphones all over. Today we see people now driving the road now and they can ah the the full tank flute, the full tank they have to look in, right? Now when this happens, of course now this the whole thing is commenting. We are commenting now about well how can people now do this? But the point is this, if you want to behave like that. And you do know that people around you may see you, they'll take a video of what you are doing and put a storm and go to viral. We are living in a world where this is daily occurrence. Am I correct? We are living in a world where it's a daily occurrence. And my point is this. And therefore, we now actually have lesser expectation of privacy. In the past, in the 1800, wherever you go, nobody knows. And you will expect that because why? There's no way to know. But now, your phone has a Google tracking system inside, am I correct? Wherever you go, they know. So, my point is, what are you seeing? You said, I spend time with You are living in a world where you will be tracked anyway. And so, my point is that, if this is the test, if this is the test, what do you expect? Honestly, basic lesson. I agree, basic lesson. So, therefore, now, is we end up getting lesser. If your reason and is lesser, you get lesser. In time to come, our privacy will be more and more important. That's true. You know. The word erosion of privacy is a good term, I think. A good phrase to use an answer. That yes, today we may have laws of privacy. But if our laws of privacy is based on what we expect, it's terrible. If the laws of privacy is based on what we expect, it's terrible because why we are today increasingly Expecting lesser. Okay. And Facebook is an example of how information can be so easily leaked out. You know, you download app. To get the app, you must surrender the information. Am I correct? Of course, they will say things like, you know, what they can see or don't see, but the point is that many of don't read or don't understand. Your not even app, your your app, the your, your software. We you have the software now. To use an automatic update, am I correct? No, that comes with limitations. So you may agree to a set of guidelines of privacy now, but what about updates? I need to check every update privacy policy. You know what what, what you can change to it. And so we live in a world where we have less expected privacy. You get the same, you get the same privacy. So it's a point. We should not let the tail wreck the